Hello, listeners, and welcome back to the Community Exchange Podcast, where we talk to friends, old and new, about their careers and the future of the media industry. My name is Matthew Goldstein, better known as MSG in the industry. Uh, as always, the Community Exchange Podcast is brought to you by Open Web, the company building a safer, fairer, and more trustworthy internet. Now, we have a great conversation with you. David Raleigh, who, by the way, we're wearing the same outfit. You got the same, you got the memo, obviously. It, it was like the TikTok, <laughs> like I come out, you come out, same outfit. Yeah. David has a passion for helping content owners create, maximize, and future-proof monetization channels. And personalization, a success as a service, whatever the hell that means. No idea. He spent the last 20 years focused on revenue operations and now a little more technology side mm -hmm. of the business, helping media owners of all sizes build out ad ops teams and ad tech stacks. Specifically, he helped companies like Advance, Local, MBCU, She Media, Travel Zoo expand their programmatic capabilities. Programmatic capabilities, in-house creative yield manager, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Now I was going to awesome. take off my shirt, but I'll just leave it Please like this me. with the matching outfits. Oh, it's not that <laughs> no, bad. No, this is perfect. We look like we're uh, in in a band or like a troop. Oh, we've got to talk about or something. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. Yeah which is you went to college where, and how did you get into this technical stuff from where you started in college? Yeah, well, it's it's funny, weird, all those. Like, I have no clue where where I am or why I'm here, but it's it's awesome to, to you know, to, to be at this point where I am. Um, it started in college. So I went to Oberlin in Ohio, which is a small liberal arts college. Yeah, I have a friend who goes there. It's a really small college. Yeah, it's small. It's got a great music conservatory. Uh, but I went there for religion and art was my minor. So, you know, religion, was, really? Yeah, it was comparative religion, mostly studied Judaism, Taoism, most of the, the spiritual stuff. Which That's a whole separate conversation we'll have. It is, it is. Um, but I loved it. And art was my minor, mostly photography. Um, and the best thing about it was the fact that in senior year, I was able to do a study abroad program, which was in New York, not like, you know, Madrid or anywhere else. Wait, you else. went to Oberlin in Ohio and yeah. you do a study abroad in New York City? Well, yeah, but when you're there, it feels like okay. New York is abroad. Um, so I, I, I did a whole, uh, three month internship with, um, a photographer who focused on, um, performance art, did a lot of, um, did a lot of shooting of like the Worcester group and other cool, uh, musicians, dancers, That's all of that crazy. stuff in the city. And it just blew my mind. And I knew that I had to come back here. Where'd you grow up before you went to college? Uh, just outside of Philadelphia in Swarthmore. Okay. And I grew up just outside of Philly and Lafayette Hill. There you go. <laughs> Philly. Okay. Life. So yeah, let's go Eagles, right? Yeah. Fly yeah, birds yeah. Fly. <laughs> okay. So how did you do that to your first job at an ad agency. Uh, that's that took about four to five years or so. Um, so, I, like I said, as soon as I came to New York, uh, studied did you know studied abroad here, I knew that I wanted to come back. So as soon as I graduated, I moved to New York City, became you know your typical starving artist, worked as a waiter, worked as a that was not on your LinkedIn. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Worked as a waiter, worked as a, what year was this? a musician. This was nine, uh, I graduated in 94. Okay. Yeah. Long time, long time. So like uh, 94 to 98, you were the starving artist in New York City. Pretty wearing, much. Wearing black. Pretty much, yeah. Photography, if I, if, the I, thing. if I could afford it. So worked at a couple of different uh, photo places, worked, tried to be a photographer, but mostly worked as a photo assistant. So the guy who, you know, put the cameras together, put the lights together, went on the shoots, like, did all the grunt work, but it was fascinating. Um, it was a great way to just like, you know, live in the city for a few years, make some money. Uh, but ultimately, you know, where did you, where'd you live in the city then? Oh God. I started in Staten Island, then moved up to Washington Heights, then, um, Harlem and then Upper East Side. Wow. Like at least, you know, <laughs> okay. So how did every, you transition from starving artist photographer living everywhere to, getting a real job. Yeah, well, so most of those stories, there's usually a girl involved, and, <laughs> and there was. Okay. Uh, and so the girl made me realize that I need to start making more money if I ever want to, like, be, you know, <laughs> eventually marry her, have family. Is cetera, that girl still in your life? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, in a different way now. Okay. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so I knew that I needed to have some sort of uh, – corporate job or a job that had a career path, uh, which my current job didn't have. So the photographer that I was working for at the time did a ton of work with agencies. 
So still as, life. As they all did, right? Yes. Okay. Exactly. Uh, so I, I then therefore met a lot of agency folks, and that's kind of the way that I knew I wanted to get into at least, you know, a- agency work because it was creative on the one hand, but also, you know, there was a corporate I'm, I'm just path. sitting here amazed that the creative art history, photography, yeah, yeah, yeah. religion. Right. And now you're running tech for a big <laughs> news company. We, 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 to get to how you got there, it feels like it's a disconnect in my mind. No, well, I mean, it's it's it took a long time. Okay, so okay. it's obviously been okay. like 20, 20 plus years. Okay, so yeah. Young and Rubicon, right? Which is part of what holding company or that those? is WPP. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I get confused with every single holding company and who and I what. I still do as well. And I think the naming they need to change that naming convention <laughs> and be Young and Rubicon or WPP Young and Rubicon. Right. Well, it was the start of the acronyms. Okay. Right. Uh, so yeah, I was at Young and Rubicam for about four years. The, the great thing about the original job that I started in was, uh, basically a, uh, an executive assistant to the president of YNR. So not only do I come in to my first corporate gig, but it's also at the highest level of the company. So I remember my, as an assistant, I remember my least, days at Viacom yeah. and the executive assistants to the CEOs were yeah. some of the nicest, smartest, best people around. Well, I just loved being. I was one of those people. Okay. (laughs) Uh, But it was a great way to get in at kind of like 30,000 feet and being able to understand how the agency works and all of the different. uh, Do you still understand how the agencies work today? No, 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 because it's totally, (laughs) totally different. And this is also right when digital was just becoming a capability. Um, it was still a lot of print, still a lot of TV, which again, it still okay. is, but digital was, was much less, much less a thing at the time. So I think I did about six to eight months as an executive assistant, then went all the way down to account coordinator and started making, started making the, you know, the path up to the, uh, down the account management role. Were you trafficking at any point then? Um, there was trafficking involved, not digital trafficking okay. like you would expect, but yes, moving papers around and sending the emails that were necessary to get productions done for TV, for radio, for, for all of the things that needed. That okay. Needed and then, happen. and then you smartly left the agency world. I did. Four I did. years, right? Yeah, but it was great. So I did. Yeah. And so I did account management, brand planning, uh, another like chief of staff role for a little bit. And then the chief of staff ends up being such an important role in today's world. It does. It does. Um, I almost feel like if that, if I didn't go on the path that I did, that a chief of staff role would kind of be like the right fit for me. And I may, I may do it at some point eventually in my career. Right. And it feels like for my career path, if I didn't yeah. do what I did, I could have been a chief of staff or product right. person or my favorite real job. Yeah. Yeah. Wealth management. There. Right. I didn't see that coming. That's my, that, <laughs> that's, that's my next career. Interesting. Okay. All right, good for you. Vertical videos, the whole thing. That's what I'm gonna do next on TikTok. Okay. Well, if you need some guinea pigs or anything, I do, well, I do. Let me know. Okay, maybe the last five minutes we'll talk about that. I can transition. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Okay. So then after YNR, you went to went to Travel Zoo. Yeah. And so this this was a great a great role, great company, uh, mainly because it was kind of at the I mean, they didn't have ads per se. They were almost like native ads before native ads were a thing. So And they, who owned Travel Zoo then or now? They were a private company, which okay. they eventually went public and and still do. Um, so they're they're a public company, not okay. owned by not not owned by anybody. Okay. Uh, so they're all travel deals. All v- so it was almost like a combination of news service, but around travel deals. So we still kind of thought of ourselves as a travel publisher, but very much focused on the deal. So understand and working with all of the, you know, all of the various uh, people in the, in the travel space, like, you know, your hotels, your chains, your, your airlines, et cetera. Okay. Putting out all of the best deals uh, to, to, you know, all, and what all of role did you start there? I started as a content writer. So basically writing up the deals. Dude. Source, <laughs> so sourcing, you had more creative, more creative deals. side. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And you were writing then without the help of Gen AI. That was real writing. Pretty much. That was exactly. And then moved into a, um, uh, what did I do next? Moved into a role where it was more product management, uh, still writing content, but um, publishing a newsletter. And when did you get into the whole programmatic ad ops world? Like, when did that happen? So that happened. So the the last job that I had at Travel Zoo was, and this is the slight connection, uh, was focused on inventory management. So because all of the various placements on the website and in our newsletters were were sold. Um, we had to have some sort of way of planning that inventory and knowing, you know, 
six weeks out, eight weeks out, ten weeks out, what you know, what space. So they, they looked at you, the jack of all trades, to build out a inventory, you know, planning system. Which again, at that stage, what were you building was, out in Excel? Excel, yeah, yeah. There were, pivot there, tables. There was no yield X. There was no pivot tables. Of course, yeah, yeah, you have to. So that's the transition into that was, I'm an analytical person now. Correct, correct. And why well, they why they pick you to do that? Uh, because I was good at it. Okay. <laughs> and they realized that it was that I that one of the well one of my products that was um, was a weekend newsletter called Weekend.com. They were shutting that down because it wasn't. I mean, it was. I thought it was doing well, but they ne they needed to re oh. refocus and repivot. So they put me into a into a role that was much more uh, required at that. Okay, point. so you went from the photographer writer creative dude so i am now Into cranking out excel pivot inventory table analysis exactly and did you like exactly. that i guess you did um i did i did um but it was it was something that i was looking for looking for more yeah which is why you took that job which is which is why i took the job correct. okay exactly and then what happened after travels or did you peeked out and you said okay that's it i'm moving on it was i wish it was that it was one of my one of my one of my two uh layoffs in my career. You know something on a previous podcast I admitted yeah, yeah. that I was laid off and Oh yeah, no, I mean there, there's no shame. There's I know, no but shame no there. one ever admits those things. It's like <laughs> taboo to admit, but it's yeah. okay because it happens and sometimes it has nothing to do with you. Most no, no, no. It it yeah. usually always has nothing to do with right. you. Um and and for me and and probably for you as well, like the life lessons that you learn from it. Uh, un unquestionably the, the best the it's best easy to ever. say that in hindsight in hindsight happens, for it sure it's horrible yeah, yeah yeah but it ends up it happened to me one of the best things that ever happened it's how i started consulting but this is about you so okay so your <laughs> right. travels there they're like okay david that's it yeah yeah your yep. yield management system exactly. sucks or you've built it well enough or we're gonna do no, it it's more that you have somebody underneath you that that can do your job and they're and... cheaper so we'll take them exactly. okay so how did exactly. you go from there to what was next so it took a few months to find something um eventually that uh turned into an opportunity that i I had to do something similar, uh, which was somewhat similar. It was a stretch, but uh, was basically to run um, ad operations at uh, BlogHer. And BlogHer, I get confused all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. She Media is at Penske. Like, who owns BlogHer now? Yeah. So back then, they were their own their own startup. It was a, 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 a basically a women's blogging network of roughly, I think, three thousand right. women's blogs. Across the traditional verticals of of, of food, parenting, Which probably today was like a, almost a version of Raptive or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. It it really was. Um, it was exactly that. So we controlled the ad code. We we didn't control their you know their um, their CMSs or anything, uh, but we controlled all all of the ad code. And it was it was a great transition. Uh, I learned. Um, are we allowed to curse? Yes, you're allowed to curse. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. Learn a shit ton um, along the way. Did you have a great boss then or something? It was, yeah. And actually, you may know her. Um, my main boss was uh, Gina Garubo. She's over at N NPR right now. Okay. Um, just a fantastic, fantastic It always boss. helps having that great boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she just let me do do anything, um, build, out the, build out the group. Again, we couldn't you know, add too many people, but we just, I was given the flexibility to build out the, you know, build out the, the department basically. Um, so to move over, like to migrate over to a ad server to my, to bring in a data management platform again, like these, the great thing about that job, I think it was roughly four years or so. Everything that we now know in our industry as just commonplace, all of that happened in those four years. So ad server, uh, order management platform. Right, everything we never was had. nascent then. You were, you were, everything, it was Data literally all Excel. platform, programmatic. Um, that's where it originated. So br being able to bring those into a startup was was just, it, it, for me, not just revolutionary, but being able to just learn, learn. Yeah, sort of like fly. I say the same thing. Like I learned everything I learned at Dakota pretty much. Yep. And I took everything I learned and did it for the next 15 years. It's the totally. same thing when you learn that and you're doing it by yourself at the beginning when it's happening. That's what I think when you really learn the most. Yeah, exactly. And so it was that it was that experience that I was then able to, you know, to take into other forays. Um, and that almost became the skill set of, of building out departments, building out uh, capabilities, building out ad stacks. And yeah, that's kind of where I eventually got to, you know, to today. Okay, so blog her. What happened after that? Uh, blog her. Then event did about a year or so at NBCU. Um, pretty big, much big conglomerate. 
big conglomerate. It was it was a big. Did you work with Linda Yaccarino? I did, but didn't. Talk, okay. <laughs> talk to her too much. Uh, mainly because there were a lot of a lot of uh, titles between us. Okay. Um, but Peter Blacker was probably the guy who. And uh, and were you a ad ops person or a tech person at that point? It was still operational, but also then went back into a an, more of an analytical role. Okay. Um, because it was then kind of leaning a little bit more back on my inventory. But at some point, you morphed planning. into a technical person, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. So let's get to there. Okay. So then yeah, you yeah. were at NBCU for a little time, and right? And then moved over to Advanced Local, where for seven years or so, really focused on building out operations, building out An advanced local back. zone by the new house. Yes, right? How many, how so many local it is, they have? Oh, I'm blanking on the number, but effectively they are, they own the majority of the newspapers in Michigan, Alabama, uh, here locally. Okay. At least it, it, they have NJ.com, the star ledger. Um, so yeah, they have got about, I think 20 plus. And they're a papers. pretty well-run company, right? It's a, a very well-run company. So it's, yeah, it's new house. So it's advanced local, it's Condé Nast. So we're effectively the newspaper version okay. of, of Condé. And what'd you do there? Uh, mainly, uh, ad operations and, and ad technology. Okay. So you started doing more ad technology then? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the big difference with, with this role was the, not just, you know, serving on our owned and operated, but because we were serving local constituents, uh, we were serving a lot of small and medium sized businesses. So therefore we had, we had to do other, um, other media capabilities. So be able to handle search campaigns, social campaigns, um, branded content to a certain extent. So it, what was nice is, you know, up until that point, I had known everything about, you know, ad server, ad serving as it relates to just, you know, one particular site or okay. at least what we owned here, we were able to, you know, to pitch, you know, uh, all sorts of sorts of campaigns. And at what point did you move to Montclair? Uh, that was right after the, not, not the pandemic, sorry, right after 9-11. So yeah, okay. I've, I'd, I'd been in Jersey for, for 20 plus years okay. at that point. Okay. So now you're advanced local. Yep. What happened next? Uh, advanced local. That's where the second, <laughs> the second layoff comes okay. in, which was more of a, and, and it happened right about a year after the pandemic or so. So local was struggling and it was struggling even more because. Oh, so we're talking 2021 now. We're talking 2021. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So mainly there was a whole like uh, cross section of the company from a from a title perspective that they just slashed out um and i was one of those unfortunately so again going back to the point that it's never you it's really all about you know you're some number in somebody's spreadsheet um usually in, in the finance company uh or in the finance department and yeah so it was it was a shame but the and i guess going back to my original layoff is that the one the one main thing that i learned then was the importance of networking. And I knew, and the network effect, and I knew back then being laid off at Travel Zoo that I didn't have enough of a network. And so from that point on, I had been focusing on building out the network, going to conferences. Which is sort of what I've been doing my whole, like. Yeah, exactly, like I, exactly. And, the and thing, you're kind of the blueprint for it. And I get frustrated sometimes when people reach out to me and I haven't spoke to them in three, four, five years, and they reach out to me with the email saying, "Hey, I just got laid off. Yep. Do you want to talk?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I'll talk to you." But like, I send out th eight emails a a, a year. You yep. can't just check in, and you, like, I just feel like that's <laughs> right. not networking when you need something. No, networking no, no, is no, when no. you don't need something. Is when you have those conversations. Exactly, exactly. And and that that is one thing that I do need to always do better at is 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 the not the constant but the more like the checking in on an ongoing basis with you know as many people as possible well there's sometimes on a random saturday or sunday i'll sit on my phone and just check in with people all day long yeah and i don't and i do it because i genuinely am curious and i care right right yeah i haven't gotten one of those texts in a couple of weeks so well, clearly you don't care well because i knew i was seeing you here <laughs> fair point right fine yeah sure I'll believe it. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> thanks. Okay. So then number two happened. And both, thank you yeah, for yeah. being honest. No, no, I think this is something about being honest. And when people listen to these conversations, they like the honesty. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think it goes back to just being able, you, I, I think you learn way more from your mistakes than you do your successes. So, um, you know, I, I see resignation or resignations layoffs as uh, not a mistake, but something negative that you need to turn into, you know, turn into a positive. Um, and so this go around from advanced to News Corp, 
Um, how'd you get from the advanced to News Corp COVID? Like how, I, how yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that, um, I, cause I, I, I actually think that's a fascinating conversation today because yeah. there are probably more layoffs in the industry happening today than they have in, yeah, in, in decades. In, in, in right. So I think like a lot forever. of people listening or watching are like, okay, how did you make that transition happen? Yeah. I mean, it is, I think it's the network effect. It's, it's part luck. I think more than anything. There's a lot of luck and timing. Um, so it, it was kind of a, it, it was kind of a two step. So I was um, interviewing for a position at the Wall Street Journal, uh, and eventually got to who I'm sure you know, David Minkin. Uh, so him and I hit it off. He's also a fellow uh, religion major. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's two of you in the industry. Yeah, two of us, pretty much. There's probably more, but yeah, at right. least we've accounted for for us. There's any other religion majors? Hit me up, and Let we'll do a know. podcast on that because exactly. maybe there's a pattern here. It's fascinating. Uh, so him and I hit it off. Great guy. Um, didn't end up getting the role. Uh, he just didn't think it was it was too senior. Um, he thought it was uh, too junior for me. Um, but I was I was in his mind, uh, and funny enough. Steph Laser, who everybody knows. I don't know who's Steph Laser. I don't know who she is. No clue. Uh, just met her at the time. Uh, she, again, we'll, we'll we'll talk about the News Corp hierarchy yes. and, and how things work. Um, but so she was where she was, you know, had been in News Corp for several years. Uh, her and Minkin were obviously very close. Uh, and Steph was going out on maternity leave in a few months. Oh, and they needed someone and to fill in for her. And they need someone because News Corp has an amazing six month. Oh, that's such a great story for right for for new right for new parents, and so they needed someone to fill in a consultant on a consultant consultancy. Basis. And this is more the tech side of the business too, right? Yeah, correct. Okay, correct. Um, and it was yeah, and so uh, Minkin told her about me. Steph and I talked. Steph and I had already known each other just through the industry, right? Um, but so there was an instant you know camaraderie understanding of, of capabilities and experience. And so did a few interviews, um, interviewed with her, interviewed with uh, Jenny, who was my boss for several months. Jenny Baird? Jenny Baird, correct. Okay. Who I know you talked to a, f a few podcasts ago. Yes. So. Uh, and so it just, it worked out perfectly. And then what happened when Steph came back from maternity leave? Yeah, so six months, I you know kept the trains running, kept the projects running. It's so funny you say that because like that was some of the things that I did at Dakota. Like I yeah. kept the trains running on time. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And people think it's an easy job. No, no. When no. you're growing, there's a lot going on. That is hard to do. Yeah, well, it's also more difficult when you're when you're slapped right into you yes. know <laughs> a train schedule that's already like and you have big shoes to fill. Correct, very big shoes to fill. So. You know, I had, I had done, you know, these kind of roles before, uh, but I think also I think just the the, the breadth, scope the and the size yes. and the breadth of, of News Corp it was um, was tough to get <laughs> to get used to. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I struggled for a bit. And also, too, I, I think the struggle was also as uh, related to the fact that it was still still COVID times, still remote work. And, and I was, well, it's very hard to develop relationships with people working 100%. remotely. Yep. Especially if you get thrown into a job yeah. like that, following Steph's footprints when she's away, like that's not easy to do. Yep. No, exactly. So it was a struggle and it took roughly two to three months to get used to. And, you know, then I were think you working 60, to, 80 hours a week there just to like, it wasn't that bad. Okay. Um, but it was, it was high up there and, and it wasn't demanded. It was more just me like demanding that of myself and knowing that I, I can't mess this up. Right. Cause <laughs> you saw this as your opportunity. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 the, like after the six months, there was no guarantee of anything else. So I, I knew that you know if if I if I perform, if I do well, that you know I can hopefully try to make you know a name for myself and or just you know get on Jen, in Jenny's good graces. But it must have been a little stressful as month five rolls around and yeah. she's about to come back, and then what happens next? Well, what, so, so what did happen next? Yeah, so there I mean, there was a role that was available uh, that I. Uh, that I was able to get on on Steph's team, which was fantastic. So that that role was focused more on uh, the data and identity side of of the products that. that and this News was across had. all of News Corp, all the brands, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So um, so yeah, as soon as she came back, I reported into her, and it was great. It was fantastic. It was it was 
her and I had a few weeks of transition before she left, uh, but it was much better clearly to have, you know, a few months of her uh, and really able to, you know, because again, like, like I'd mentioned, we were friends, we had known each other through the industry, but to be able to work with her uh, right. that closely for several months was, was great. And then when did she leave to go to AWS? Yeah, so she, I think it was probably 9, 10, 11 months, something around there. Okay. Uh, so it was a pretty, it was a pretty qu quick transition. Uh, and then I assumed, uh, the, the, the stuff that most of the stuff that she was working on when she moved over to AWS and then officially moved into her, into her role, probably a few months, a few months later. And that's what you're doing now at News Corp or is it a bigger role now? So it is, it's, it's, it's a bigger, and again, like there, there's no way to, you know, to compare what, what Steph does and what I do. And then just the brain that she has versus yep. the brain that I have. Um, so w we, we do things in very different ways. Um, I would n in no way try to compare myself to, <laughs> to her. Um, so I've, I've just taken the position and, and tried to mold it into a way that one, you know, still provide things that the company needs and and provide that that i guess um industry leadership and and understanding of what's going on within the industry and provide that you know that research and that advisory type of right. type of role um but also bring things that i'm interested in and also things and and trends that i believe are going to i think shape the industry and affect the company um, more so in, in the coming, in the coming years. Right. And who runs, who's the CEO of News Corp? Uh, that is the illustrious Robert Thompson. Love that guy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He is fantastic. I, it feels like he has such a hold on the news world and what's going on. And it's so articulate. When I listen to the yeah. earnings calls, he just blows me away. He is, he is phenomenal in so many ways. And I, I, I do get to interact with him every once in a while. That's nice. Which, um, and it's, it's just great to see his, his brilliance. And it's, what's nice about him is, is that he's uh, smart in so many different ways, uh, really understands the editorial side of the business. Uh, cause that's, that's where he, you know, where he grew up in and loves that side of the business, clearly loves the, the, the business side as well and understands the, you know, the dance between the two. Um, but really, and it is, it is a dance and, yeah. and it feels like the dance between editorial and business is getting closer and closer as time goes on with Gen it, AI happening and everything else. Yeah, it, it is getting closer. Um, I think it's, it's AI, I think it's data and I think it's the understanding that, um, that the the two worlds can learn more from each other, uh, and and they clearly depend on each other. I mean, that journalists can't do their job without advertising, and we wouldn't have jobs without the content that they produce. Did you spend much time at your job with the editorial side? Uh, not enough, right? Um, and I tried every once in a while. It's to, very hard to break through on is. the editorial side. It is well, and it was your and I'm blanking on her last name, Jamie, one of your close friends who Jamie Heller, who, Jamie Heller, who was the editor at the Wall Street Journal. Right. And now she's at Insider? She's the right? editor-in-chief at the, as Insider. There you go. The um, smartest, hardest working people I know who will yeah. be in that seat in the next couple of months. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So as soon as I met her. Which, which by the way, goes back to like the networking. Like always. part of the reason I have my dinners yep. and that Open Web has the dinners with me is yep. A, it builds great credibility for the open web brand. And it's also bringing people together. Totally. Because sometimes I don't realize I have all these dinners and I brought people together and they have these relationships. And it's mostly because like I help bring them together, which yeah. is like, feels so good as part of being part of the industry. It's crucial. It's, 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 it's a major importance to everything that we do. I mean, cause we, you can't go it alone. We can't do this by ourselves. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that, you know, based on the, the, the other subjects that we'll bring up. But yeah, it's uh, so Jamie. Back to her. She was the one. Like as soon as we met, I think you introduced me at one of one of the one of the roundtables. Um, I asked her to you know you know take you know give me a. Oh, tour. So that was your first time talking to an editorial person. Well, <laughs> at at News Corp. And right, at because News I because you happen to meet someone. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was you know happenstance, but it, it worked out perfectly. Uh, so she was able to give me a tour of, of all the, you know, the, the various newsrooms at, at the journal. And it was just, it's, it's that plus, I think all of the, all of the, the, the drama that happened with Evan over the last year plus, yeah. um, really kind of, not that it wasn't there, but really just helped solidify, you know, the importance of what we do and, and what we support day in, day out.
Okay, so I got a question for you. We're taping this yeah, yeah. on October 16th. Yes. Uh, I've done 35 roundtables. I think you missed my last one. 35, <laughs> 35 roundtables. It was in Denver. 35 roundtables yeah, yeah. with Rich Cacopolo from Daily Mail. Yep. And I've tried so hard over my career to bring publishers together. And yep. I've brought publishers together so many times, but nothing formal right. has ever happened. Right. And before we started talking, you were saying... Yes, uh, that I feel like now more than ever, there needs to be some sort of, and, and there are in some ways, but some sort of deeper, tighter business technical alignment with publishers. Okay, so what does that mean? How does it, can you go a layer deeper? Like, yeah. What does that mean? It means that- I, I, I agree, I just don't know how to do it. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm sure you've seen the, the, the charts and I mean, we've, we've felt it over the last, you know, 10 plus years where basically all of the big tech companies have been eating our lunch and taking ad spend away you know, again, it, with good measure because they have great products and that's where then they have the scale, they have amazing products and and all of that. But our our share of- When you say our share, the open internet- Open internet, yeah, right, not which, just News Corp. Right, just which, open which internet. Which used to be 30%, 40% is probably down now to, to 10, 6. 6 to 10% 6 to 7%. And it's, and it's either going to plateau or go even go even further. Um, and then when you see that- And because all those to, dollars went to pretty much- It went to Amazon, Google, um, Facebook, Facebook, and, uh, C and CTV, CTV now. Definitely, yeah, yeah. And, TikTok. And partly because they all have built-in measurement and attribution. They have addressability. And we right. don't. They have addressability, and more importantly, they have closed-loop attribution, and that's the biggest thing. And the open internet does not- which yes. is something that has to change, which I agree. Correct. When publishers get together, measurement and attribution, I believe, is the piece that brings us all together. So a dollar spent on the open internet actually gets measured at it's working because yep. right now publishers are handcuffed and that doesn't happen. 100%. Yes. And if you look out for the next five years, the big talking point is a lot of the, well, actually most of the incremental spend ad spend is going to be going towards retail media. Because they have- Retail media have as well. Closed loop attribution, Closed, right? Who's correct. buying because they get the email address and everything, right? So all of these publishers, which are again like your dot dashes, your 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 news corps, your New York Times, um, and and even all of the 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 more medium and smaller tail like the Raptives and the Media Vines, all of those, like th there 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 does need to be a I think a coming together um, from a platformed perspective. So, and again, I I. I haven't seen it anywhere, so I don't know if I'm coining it, but it almost feels like it needs to go from the premium web needs to go to the platformed web. Like there needs to be a platform that we all have in common that would make it a lot easier to for agencies and advertisers to to buy us at scale and to buy us in an easy in an easy way with the attribution on on top. So when Rich and I from Daily Mail talk all the time, we yeah, always yeah. say that targeting is easy. Right. Measurement and attribution is where the hard work has to happen. Right. And as cookies go away, or as cookies, there's fewer cookies out there, it makes yep. it harder and harder. Yep. And maybe Google Privacy Sandbox helps solve this. It 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 is oh. a solve for a part of it. And and yeah, I, I know there's there's been, and I think Dot Dash is the one, the ones that have been doing this really well testing testing the measurements uh, the measurement api and 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 that might be an opportunity uh for sure uh we've been doing more of the the, the poppy and the topics testing around right. privacy sandbox less so measurements so there's clearly gigantic white space in yes. the industry yeah for an open internet measurement and attribution company to step in yeah uh, maybe now with the two google lawsuits <laughs> there is more money that happens that gets thrown against this. Yeah. I'm in complete agreement. I yeah. just don't know how to do it. But I think you're right. If it doesn't happen, that six or seven percent right. goes down or yeah. stays flat, which is unfortunate. And I don't know exactly how it looks like either. And I think that that will come out in the next in the next several months. I mean, the the need for some sort of publisher alliance is not new. Um, and again, like yes, it has been a conversation for years, as you can attest to. Um, but there is open AP on the broadcast side. There is ozone in the UK. And so 
those models could be something that we import into, you know, into the U.S. market and within our, you know, display and video. Yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah. And it's on my list. I need to figure out more. Okay. Right. So solve for it. I'm going to try it. Before <laughs> we close, I have, there's a yeah, couple yeah. things I have to talk to you about. We're at time already? We're close. Jesus. What do you do in your pastime? What do you do in your free time? What is uh, your big hobby? Okay. So there's not a ton of, of free time, as okay. you can imagine. What do you do in your little bit of free time you have? <laughs> uh, so I have two boys, uh, 17 and 14. So they're usually either their activities or doing stuff for them is is first and foremost from a priority, prioritization perspective. So dad is is high up there on the list and then probably the next highest on the list is uh music so okay I'm, that's I'm i don't care, i don't care about the kids i want to talk about the music <laughs> screw the kids okay so the yeah. name of your band is gin and sonic gin and like you drink sonic. a gin and tonic yeah like but gin you, and tonic but gin and sonic so and you play what instrument it's the band that you can drink so i play okay. i play drums. not funny but okay it's kind of funny. okay uh, so we've been around for about a year or so. Uh, you know, the 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 pianist and I had been talking for years about setting something up, so we finally did. So you and play in the big city, or you play out in Jersey? We shockingly have a gig at Connolly's on on Forty Fifth in January at some point. So that'll be our first. I, New York I, gig. You're not giving me an exact date. Uh, January twenty fifth. Okay. Think? Something like something around there. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll send out pressers. Don't worry. Uh, uh, but most of the gigs so far have been in Jersey. Montclair, Bloomfield, all in Essex. And I know the answer. You probably yeah, yeah. play all old stuff, right? So it's, it's got to be seventies rock. Yeah, it's it's a little bit of classic. It's classic rock. It's but it's also eighties, nineties. It's anything that folks will can sing to, uh, and also th that they want to hear. So what, what's in our set list now? Um, Benny and the Jets, Elton John, um, old Adele. Okay, not that old. <laughs> Peace, love, and understanding. Bruce Springsteen, uh, uh, Tom Petty. We do have a Springsteen song. Um, we what else do we play? Uh, there's a bunch of others, but but we try we try to do stuff that we either listened to when we were kids, um, you know, growing up in our parents' household, or or during college. So there's like there's some and you have some side hustle related to music as well that you do. Yeah, this was a there was, there was a actually right before the pandemic, maybe six months before. I'd been working on something called uh, Bootleg, which was effectively trying to build out a platform for uh, virtual concerts. So if you could not, so it, it would basically take a concert that would not be, um, that you would not need to actually attend. Uh, you didn't need to be in the time or the space where the concert was happening, but you could have a virtual ticket to be able to watch it. Um, and so we didn't build out anything. I had built out a, a, a business model and a capability and then pitched it around a little bit. Uh, and then, you know, obviously the pandemic happened. So I thought it would be opportune time to even pitch this more. Uh, but it just, it never happened. Um, and shockingly, and actually not shockingly, <laughs> the thing that held it back was, was rights and licensing. Oh, sure. And I just, so th there is probably a way in. Like probably go focus on independent artists and things like that, but it's just you know with with the the full time job at News Corp, I haven't been able to get back to the side hustle. And then going back to like business for a sec, because yeah. I, I, but I love that side gig of yeah, yeah. the drummer. Yep. Where do you see the industry in three or five years, or where do you see yourself in three to five years? Uh, I did uh, not ask you this as a pre question. <laughs> so where do you? No, no, no. I mean, I again, I I still I, I think. <sighs> So what I don't see, I, I still might, I, I still see myself hopefully doing what I'm doing now in the next three to five years, hopefully at News Corp because I love the company. Um, and I, and I know everyone says this about their company, but I truly believe it. Smartest people, um, great company, great culture. Uh, so I would love to continue to work there doing what I'm doing. Um, I see over the next three to five years, at least from a market standpoint, more and more consolidation, uh, both from an ad tech and a martech perspective, um, not just consolidation with with companies closing down, um, but more consolidation within and within actual ad stacks and martech stacks themselves. So, you know, the traditional Loomiscape where you have advertisers, publishers on one side, all of the intermediaries compresses. in between it compresses, and you see a lot of, and you won't see. I mean, eventually you'll you'll see this, but I think 
either an AW, probably AWS, um, or Snowflake or others will be kind of like this root system that grows underneath and really combines advertisers and publishers together from a collaboration standpoint, data sharing, um, every, everything that we're going to need to do over the next three to five years is, is helping, helping unlock advertising spend and make it easier for agencies and advertisers to spend on the open web. And that will only come from more data sharing. Do you think there's a new ad server out there that's going to emerge? Yeah, I think, as... uh, Mediavine <laughs> released one yesterday. Oh, did they? Well, that they they mentioned something. I had already left by this by this point. But at this pre- is the Prebid conference at Prebid Summit. They had, they had mentioned something. Um, you, I, I could. Well, it depends on how things go with the trial uh, and right. what the remedies are. Uh, if gamma and addicts get sliced off um which if i'm a betting man right now i say something I, will happen eventually. i yes. that that's where my money would be as well um and you know i mean we've you know we've joked around a, a few of us like could you know could there be a, a publishing venture with some vc capital obviously that 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 or um or some private equity that that with a bunch of publishers that buys gam and addicts and and turns it into something that would be beneficial. Yeah, I just don't know the price tag of gamut addicts might be so that's, that's expensive. The thing. That's the thing. Um so that could be uh that will definitely be something that we'll focus on. Um there there could also be something either through AWS or prebid or or some somewhere where there might be an, another ad server. But either way, you like I see some change. Oh, there has to be. And hopefully whatever gets built next does have measurement and attribution incorporated from the beginning. Yes. As opposed to added on or an afterthought. That plus transparency. So I think we we clearly have to be a walled garden. I think us as publishers, or at least that's my, that's my take, like I'd mentioned earlier. Um, but I think where we can dif- differentiate ourselves from a a meta or a Google is to be way more transparent than they are. And so I guess it's almost like the, the high, the hedged garden approach. Oh, hedge garden. That's a good one. Well, thank you, Luma. For okay. The, okay. So the, one last question one before last question. you wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you said you like cooking, I believe. Uh, yeah. I mean, okay. I, I try, okay. I try to like it. What's your favorite dish to cook? Oh man. Um, what's oh, your favorite God. genre to cook? Give me something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's probably Italian. So my 17-year-old loves cooking, and I probably got more into cooking because of him. He wants to go to culinary school That's awesome, or restaurant though. management. Or, Great or bonding something. with your son. It is. It is. So we probably focus on Italian the most. Um, and Sunday I'd, sauce. Like. Sunday sauce. I'd rec- recently gotten a, a cookbook from uh, Il Buco, the restaurant. Yep. And so I've been really like reading through some of those. Haven't dived into like being able to cook one of those recipes yet but okay one last last question because i have a follow-up for this one yeah uh favorite italian restaurant in either new york or new jersey or one of each Uh, oh man i i don't really have a favorite (laughs) i have some recents give Um, me some recent ones there was a um a place in oh, I'm gonna blank it's it's near Rutherford somewhere in New Jersey who's got the, and I'm blanking on the name because again you put me on the spot okay I can't remember I've got an old brain <laughs> but they have voted uh, been voted the best meatball parms in 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 the state of New New Jersey so that was great um, I'm blanking on the name of the restaurant as well but we had went to one recently on Arthur Ave. Oh, Arthur Ave is great up, is, in, up yeah, in the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've gone there a few times, and I just love the vibe up there. So any any restaurant up there, you you can't lose. David, thank yeah. you so much. Great conversation. This was awesome. Thank you. Um, thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you, Open Web. Thanks, guys. Thank you to the audience. Great conversation with David. I appreciate it. Even though we're in the same outfit, <laughs> it's still okay. For the next interview, I'm going to wear something different. I'll bring a change of clothing. Perfect. Everybody, producer Andrew, thank you. Everyone, have a good day. Nice work.